thank you very much, Lena, for that introduction. So I've been working on oil politics for almost two decades now. Um, and people usually ask me, why are you focused on just one industry, just one sector, just one commodity? Like, why just oil, right? So that's where I'm going to start today, is why care about the oil industry? Why care about big oil, the oil companies that are part of that industry? So this pie chart that you're seeing represents all man-made greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. That's the full circle. The part that I've shaded there are 90 fossil fuel companies, just 90 companies responsible for 63% of global emissions since the Industrial Revolution. Just think about that for a moment and the size of all man-made uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And some of those companies, if you can see them uh, from, from in the back, companies like Exxon, Chevron, BP that you might know. Some companies that you might not know as well, Saudi Aramco, down on the bottom there. That's Saudi Arabia's national oil company. Well, since 1965, just 20 oil and gas majors, these are the big oil and gas companies, are responsible for 35% of emissions. So these are big players when it comes to the greenhouse gas emissions that are accelerating climate change. On the other hand, these companies play a huge role in politics. After all, I'm a political scientist. In the four or five years after the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, just five oil companies, including Exxon and Chevron, spent $1 billion lobbying against policies that would mitigate climate change. $1 billion lobbying. Just think about how much that money could do if it were spent on anything else than lobbying. Right? So big, big footprint that these companies uh, occupy. The other reason to care is what is called the production gap. So if you might have seen a graph like this before, um, the green line and the blue lines at the bottom, those are the emissions that are compatible, the total worldwide emissions per year, that are compatible with keeping global warming to within the Paris Agreement limits of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming above pre-industrial levels or two degrees Celsius. The lines above, that kind of reddish and goldish lines, that's the emissions that will come from producing fossil fuels that are already committed based on existing plans and pledges and promises even after the Paris Agreement. Right? So you can see this big gap in between. The emissions coming from oil, gas, and in this case coal production, far exceed where we need to be to mitigate uh, the worst of climate change. So in light of that, and something that's happened just in the last one and a half years, are a number of these biggest companies have started to set what are called net zero goals. You may have heard this too. This is kind of a new catchphrase, net zero targets, going net zero by a certain date. Now all of these companies, these are again some of the biggest companies in the world, have set a goal of being net zero by 2050. What that means is that on net, what they emit in terms of carbon dioxide, methane, black carbon, other greenhouse gas emissions, anything that they emit, they will capture on the other side. So that net, there are zero emissions coming from their, their company. So all these companies have set these pledges. Again, all within about the last year and a half or so. Well, why are they setting these, emission, these, uh, these pledges, rather, to go net zero? You might ask yourself, like, what are they doing? Why would they do that? Why are they going to go zero emission? This is their business. Well, some of themselves, uh, some of them do not see themselves as oil companies first and foremost. In many ways, these companies see themselves as energy companies. Exxon, for example, calls itself a technology company. The technology it happens to sell now pertains to oil and gas. That didn't always used to be the case. Some of these companies are seeing their future, maybe, at least this is how they advertise it, as being clean energy champions. So on the left, that's an offshore uh, wind farm in the North Sea off the coast of the United Kingdom. This is one of the biggest offshore wind farms in the world, almost four gigawatts uh, of wind. This is huge. It's like, I don't know, a hundred times what you might see if you're driving out to Palm Springs, those old windmills from uh, the 70s and 80s. 
The developer of this offshore wind farm, in part, is Equinor. Equinor is Norway's oil company. It's state-owned and also investor-owned. Equinor figured, look, we're really good at offshore drilling. We're really good at building offshore platforms in places that are really hard to do that. I don't know if you've been to the North Sea lately. Not an easy environment to do business. High waves, really cold, and snow. So they decided and said, well, look, we're pretty good at offshore platforms. We can go into offshore wind. It's just a different thing. On the right is the biggest solar thermal facility in the world. This is one terawatt of solar uh, thermal. That's using the sun's rays to heat water. This is developed in Oman by PDO. That's Oman's national oil company. So these companies see themselves as being able to do this. They are the biggest companies in the world. They have dealt with risk their entire existence. And they know how to manage massive projects. Well, the record doesn't look that great. If you look at how many oil companies are actually on track to tackle climate change, and that means do they have plans that back up their net zero pledges or their commitments that are aligned with the Paris Agreement's goals of limiting warming to one and a half or two degrees? You might ask, well, how many oil companies are actually on track to do that? The answer is almost none. All of those in red, and these boxes are sized based on the market cap of these companies, right? So Saudi Aramco, right, right here. It's one of the biggest companies in the world by market cap, kind of dwarfs everybody else. They're certainly not on track. Exxon's not on track, Chevron, and so on and so forth. So almost none of these companies, save a select few, are actually on track even to tackle climate change. Like they have actual plans uh, that'll, that are going to get us to that limit of one and a half degrees or even two degrees more realistically. So one of the things that we need to do on the research side is try to estimate that disconnect with much more precision and to think about this gap between plans and action, between what they say and what they do. So we published a couple of scientific articles in the last year that look at this question focused on the top 10 investor-owned oil companies. These are the oil majors. And kind of the bigger question driving this is, are the oil majors walking the talk? So what do I mean by that? How well does the industry's public rhetoric on climate policy, in other words, what they talk about when it comes to climate, how they interface with the public when it comes to matters related to climate change, how well does that align with its actual operational behavior? In other words, what they do. That's kind of the walk in the talk, right? So how well does the industry's public rhetoric on climate policy align with its actual operational behavior? The question we aim to answer with a lot more precision than just kind of showing you some of the pieces that motivate the talk. So the starting point for this is actually in measurement. The first part of that question, the first kind of object, as it were, in that question, it's kind of hard to measure. How do you measure public rhetoric? Well, companies are talking in a lot of different places, in a lot of different channels. They set out press releases. Just in the past two weeks, uh, two weeks or so, Shell decided it needs to get on TikTok. So that's what they're going to do. Right? So do we measure that? Do we measure what they say to politicians? Do, they, do we measure what they say uh, anywhere in public? We decided to go a more conservative route. And by that, we want to look at what do they say in the place that it matters the most in which they can't get away with, with lies or deception as easily? In other words, a context in which there is no room for cheap talk. What is that context? Earnings calls. So let me tell you what those mean. These are quarterly calls, meetings, with a firm's investors, their shareholders. They report, they give updates on business activities, and they answer questions. The executives of that firm answer questions by shareholders. If they lie about something in the past, they are held legally accountable for that. At least in the United States, for example, we have the Exchanges Act going back to the 1930s. Right? Any, any statement made to an investor about the past that is an outright lie, can be held, a firm can be held legal, legally liable for. Not only that, if you continuously lie, people are going to sell their shares. You're going to run out of shareholders. You're going to run out of investors. 
Right? So this is a context in which there's no room for cheap talk. So we tracked what the top 10 oil majors said for about a 15 year period, 2004 to 2019, so quarterly calls. And we took all of that text, which is all tracked, everything is transcribed. It turns out to be about 16 million words. We put that into a text analytic algorithm to parse that text to look for anything that was mentioned by the firm related to climate issues. So here's an example. This is the CEO of BP, Bob Dudley, at an earnings call in July 2015, talking about carbon pricing and carbon emissions, so acknowledging that they exist. But then he's basically saying, look, we think that having a reduced carbon footprint is going to be a good thing. All right, so they're acknowledging that. But we're certainly not abandoning the oil and gas industry or the oil industry. Right? So we can take that and code it. Well, he's talking about climate, uh, climate change in general. He's talking about carbon pricing. And then we can assess valence. Is he talking about it pro, anti, or somewhere in between? This kind of falls in between. He mentions it, but he's not really saying anything about pro or against, right? They see that it's there. So we take all of those statements. It ends up being about 2,000 such calls that relate to climate issues. So a lot of this is related to other things, right? I'm asking about all other manner of things in an earnings call. We take all of that for all these firms, and we track it across six different areas. I'm going to show you some data, but I'm, I'm really just going to give you a flavor of it. Happy to talk more about it if you'd like any of these pieces. But for the earnings call in particular, we looked at six areas. We basically ran keyword searches after we parsed the text. One is how often they talk about the end of fossil fuels. Is there a world in which they're not going to be fossil fuel producers? They talk about climate science, whether they accept it, deny it, or in between. Carbon pricing, Paris Agreement, or other international agreements. National laws, right now, for example, big conversation around Build Back Better, right? And then also looking at CCS, that's carbon capture and storage, this idea of taking carbon dioxide out of the sky and putting it underground. So we track that. Now, this is the sector level difference over time. So some things are improving, but some things are staying relatively flat. You can do that by firm too, right? So this plot kind of shows you the firm level climate, uh, public facing climate policy, or rather their public rhetoric on climate. And that takes all those six and collapses it into one index for each firm. And the point of that chart is twofold. One is there's a lot going on. There's variance. This is not a uh, monolithic industry by any means. Some companies at the top, some below. The higher you are, the more pro-climate you are in your speech. The lower, the more anti. And there's a trend upwards, which is a good sign. So that's one thing. OK, I'm going to come back to that. The second is how do we measure actual operational behavior? Now, this one's a lot easier because there's a lot of data on what firms do. And we were just tracking historical firm activities across four key areas. This is a lot of, on measurement, but, but these are kind of key areas to think about when you're trying to assess how well these companies are doing on, on climate. One is their emissions. We can track that. We can measure that. How much they emit in terms of carbon dioxide, methane, black carbon, other GHGs. Another is energy efficiency. How much energy they use to produce one unit of output or even one dollar of revenue. Right? So you want to get a sense of improving energy efficiency. A lot of talk about that right now. And then we want to see how much they're spending and how much attention they're paying to oil and gas commitments in particular. And the reason for that is that every investment today is a lock-in for the future. Now, uh, that is something you can see very clearly here in Santa Barbara, for example. Right? If you look out on the horizon, if you're at the beach, you'll probably, uh, you'll probably be able to see a bunch of oil platforms, right? That's not a one-year asset. That's a 30-year, 50-year, 60-year asset. It is a big lock-in. Right? Oil can be produced for a, a very, very long time span. So the investment you make today has consequences long in the future. So we want to track that. On the other side, we want to track how well these companies were doing in investing in non-oil activities, and in particular, renewables. Wind, solar, electric vehicles, biofuels, also things like carbon dioxide removal, like carbon capture. Right? So we want to track that as well. 
So I'll just show you the, the, the raw data. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide, there's a lot going on, but the point again here is to see a lot of variation. There are a lot of lines, right? This is change over time. Some companies emit a lot more than others. Some companies are less energy efficient than others. Some are getting, uh, um, some are investing a lot more in renewable energy. That's the graph to the right. The bar chart shows the number of deals or acquisitions of renewable companies across oil companies. So BP's all the way on the left, and some are not, like Exxon, right, over this period, 2004 to 19. So a lot of variation, right? A lot of changes within the sector and, and across time. All right, so what do we do with all that? A lot of data, there's a lot more we can say about it, but to just answer the question, right, thinking about how well what you say matches up with what you do, we collapse each of those sides into a single dimension. So that bottom axis is what we call political strategy. That's the collapsed index of what they say when it comes to climate policy. Collapsed into one dimension, right? So pro-climate on the left, anti-climate on the right. The y-axis is business strategy, right? That's taking all the ones that I just showed you and collapse those into one metric or one dimension. Higher up is more pro-climate business activity, so investing more in renewables, less in the oil and gas, reducing your emissions. Down at the bottom, anti-climate. And in fact, you have you kind of drew these four quadrants. That centerpiece is kind of like you're neutral on both, right in the, the middle there. So what does this look like for these companies? Well, you take these top 10 investor-owned oil companies, get all that data, and you plot it. Well, here's what things looked like before the Paris Agreement in 2015. And it's okay if you can't read the, the specific companies if you're in the back there. But the idea is to see where they fall along the graph. So there is some variation, but almost all of them are in that kind of bottom right quadrant. Now part of that is because these companies, at this time, were mostly engaged in either outright climate denial or climate obfuscation, sowing doubt. This idea that, well, there's some climate change, maybe there's not. I'll get to that in just a sec. But all are also below that dotted line on business strategy. This is a time in which these companies were effectively all in on oil. Right? This is their business as usual. They did not see any reason uh, to start investing in anything else. So this is a familiar story. And it's kind of nice that we saw that with our data too. It's a familiar story because it's something that social scientists have been able to discover uh, for about a decade now or so. And one of the biggest players in that was Naomi Oreski. She's a professor over at Harvard who wrote a book with Eric Conway called Merchants of Doubt. And if you haven't seen this book, I would highly recommend it. It is a masterpiece in how to understand industries and industry strategy. And why do I say playbook? Well, here's what's so fascinating about this industry. Fascinating in some of the worst ways, in a way. That these are the companies that, in many ways, pioneered climate modeling. In the 70s and 80s, these companies had some of the best atmospheric scientists, engineers, and just generally the best scientists in the world. They spent a lot of time thinking about how greenhouse gases would lead to global warming. It's going to affect their assets. They spent a lot of time on this internally. Externally, very different story. Externally, they sowed the seeds of doubt and uncertainty. Just like I was saying before, this idea that, well, some people say climate change is real, some people say it's not. No, there's no scientific consensus yet. And they kind of move to, well, we know climate change is happening. We didn't do it. Then they move to, well, we know climate change is happening, we did it, but we didn't do it. It's those other companies that are doing it. And now it's like, yeah, it's happening, and we can be a part of the, problem, a part of the solution, right? So, Lots of, of, of conversations around doubt and uncertainty more than anything else. And the playbook kind of tracks with uh, the tobacco industry's playbook. That's what, what gets into, uh, what uh, Professor Oreskes gets, gets into in this book as well. Okay, so what does the world look like after Paris? This is a landmark agreement that the countries of the world came to and acknowledging finally that climate change is an important issue. Countries have to make pledges to reduce emissions and stem uh, the worst of climate change. After 2015, you start to see more of a spread. Few companies all the way out over here, right? But now, 
you still don't see anybody all the way in this top left. Nobody is actually committed to a transition. Many are kind of close to there when it comes to what they say to their investors, what they say to the public, but they're not even close on the business side. Even the best performing company, so this one is Equinor, that's Norway's oil company, is not even close to that level. They are closer to what we call hedging. One foot in oil, one foot out of oil. And they don't know what the future is going to hold, and they are hedging their bets. Others are just committed to incremental change. Right? They're saying, well, we're going to start to do it. We're going to do it in 15 years, and 20 years, and 30 years, and so on. But nobody is making that transition. And lots of disconnect, again, between what they say and what they do. All right, so what do we do about that? How do we close the gap that exists between what they say and all these plans and pledges and what they actually do? So we took that data and we analyzed it in a statistical model to get a sense of what explains the variation. Because indeed there is variation, right? There are some differences. We can learn from that variation. Well, one of the things that mattered turns out to be shareholder pressure. The pressure that's applied on firms by their shareholders filing resolutions to basically disclose more information about climate, to think more about energy efficiency, to have a plan for even the modest, most modest steps of, of an energy transition. And of course, this blew up in, in a way that we certainly didn't anticipate kind of happened as our, as our work was being published. But one of the biggest wins that came in this happened last year by this company called Engine Number One. Just by show of hands, how many of you have heard of Engine Number One? Yeah, just a handful of you, right? And that's, that's perfectly normal because this is a tiny company. It's a small activist hedge fund. They owned just a, a small percentage, 0.02% of Exxon stock based in San Francisco. That's their leadership right there. This tiny little company, this tiny little activist hedge fund, managed to take down three board seats at ExxonMobil, the biggest company in the world in many ways, one of the biggest companies in history. They got three board seats out of 12 committed to a climate forward uh, member of the board. This tiny company, right, was able to convince all the shareholders of Exxon, or rather the majority of shareholders, that there needed to be a change. And that's where this paper comes in by a professor at UC San Diego, David Victor, who was working with engine number one, who's saying, look, what you have to pitch this as is we need a nimble board. Success in the future is going to be determined by who can be the most flexible, right? Who can take risks, who can think about this bottom line here, reframing corporate missions and organizations. And you start to sell that to other shareholders. You're like, look, we want a board that can roll with the punches. We want a board that can handle uncertainty that we know is built into the future. Whatever you believe about climate change, you want a board who knows what they're doing. Right? So they were able to get that win. And in that time, so just since last year, Exxon has made a number of changes. Again, incremental, but it's, it's, it's uh, heading towards a more positive direction than before. And indeed, their own net zero pledge hadn't existed until after uh, this, this pressure came. So again, that's, that's one step. We also saw that laws matter. That's certainly no surprise. And the laws where you do business matter considerably. So here's one graph that's from the London School of Economics. Uh, a couple authors, Joanna Setzer and Catherine Hyam, did this work and they assembled all of the cases of climate litigation. That's suing companies based on some climate-related concern. And that's on the rise. It's things like even the, the biggest level, suing a company for basically causing climate change and creating floods in your region. Suing a company for methane emissions or flaring in your local area, right? Polluting and creating asthma if you have a, a processing facility in your school. That's one case. Or state assigned cases. So California, for example, the Attorney General's office right now is filed a case against Exxon for plastic pollution, right? All these are instances of climate litigation. It's taking the laws that we have, right? And using those in court, right? To get these kinds of climate wins to push these companies to change. 
And the third is thinking about new rules, new policies, new regulations. I'll talk about one, which is a project that we're undertaking right now in my lab, on disclosure, climate-related disclosure. Just giving information about the risks you face from climate change as a firm and the risks your assets face, right? So the SEC right now, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, is proposing a new rule that requires companies to publish detailed climate-related information in their annual reports. So this is happening as we speak. This is a proposal. This is not yet set in stone. The public comment period, where anybody can go and comment, just closed. But the SEC is still listening to companies. And companies matter a lot, right? And you all are consumers of many of these companies, right? Companies like Apple, and Salesforce, Google, et cetera. Right? And the SEC is listening to hear their claims about the importance of disclosure. And that creates a level playing field. And that is tremendously important in thinking about the kinds of risks. All right, so we're nearing the end of our time in, in, the, in the presentation portion of this, and I want to just leave you with this before we get to questions as to what to take away from all of this. I showed you a lot of data, right? Well, first off, one takeaway is there are a lot of pledges, a lot of promises by the big oil uh, companies, but very little action. However, it is what's called a garden variety. Some companies are far more opposed to climate policy than others, and we can learn from that variation. We can study that variation. We can make sense of that, see what kinds of pressures work. Well, so how do we move forward? What kinds of pressures? So just to recap the last three, one is pressure from investors. That matters. Pressure from consumers. That matters. These things are important. Companies have to respond to their investors and who they sell their products to. Climate litigation is going to play a big role, especially based on protection rights for consumers and investors. And lastly, new regulations. We need better policies to level the playing field, and not just on disclosure, but if you think about the demand side, like I said, Build Back Better and so many other things that especially we here at UCSB are, are working hard on, my colleagues uh, Leah Stokes and, and Matt Mildenberger, um, in particular working on that demand side, making alternatives cheaper, more affordable, more accessible. So new policy matters tremendously, and we need that to level the playing field, to make it fairer for alternative en energies uh, to thrive. I will stop there, and I am very curious to hear your questions and uh, end the conversation. So thank you.